All right, today I am going to show you how to solve some problems with uh, one-dimensional and two-dimensional collisions. So here I have a picture on the right of a before the collision and an after the collision. And we can see that, there we go, M1 is smaller than M2. So M1 is smaller than M2. So if they both travel towards each other with the same velocity, when they rebound, this one's going to have a larger velocity. A lot of momentum is going to be transferred from the big guy to the little guy, so he's going to bounce back faster and in the opposite direction. So keeping that in mind. So when you're setting up problems for these, you want to be wary of your coordinates. Now, one-dimensional collisions usually going to be all in the x direction or either all in the y direction. Usually all in the x direction. Uh, it's convenient to make your axis coincide with one of the initial velocities, which makes sense. Whatever velocity your or whatever direction your velocity is in, that's the direction we choose for our x-axis. We can point the same way. Makes it easier. This one will be a positive velocity to start. This one a negative velocity. And after the collision, this guy's going to be negative. And this guy's going to be positive. So in your sketch, because you should draw all these pictures, I want pretty pictures of circles with arrows coming off of them. You need to draw the uh, velocity vectors and label them too, and also label your masses. You see up here, velocity the first one's initial, velocity the second initial, velocity the first one final, velocity the second one final. And little guy, it's M1, so we know anything with a V1 corresponds with this mass. Anything with a V2 corresponds with mass 2. So then we have to apply our conservation of momentum. We write a general expression for the total momentum before and after. So what we're doing is we're equating these two total momentums because remember, momentum is conserved. So therefore, different color. the momentum before equals the momentum after. So that's the total momentum before equals the total momentum after. So momentum of this guy plus momentum of this guy is going to equal the momentum of this guy plus momentum of this guy. And then we just plug in our known values. It's a good idea to make a chart too, like label like M1 equals whatever, V1 initial equals whatever. See what you're missing, see what you need to solve for. So it's what I did down here. Here's your uh, this same equation right here, but just written out with what the P's stand for. So if the collision is elastic, we write a second equation for the conservation of kinetic energy. So the Ke before equals the Ke after. So this only applies, only applies to perfectly elastic collisions. Things that bounce off completely, like no sticking together. And you can basically just get rid of the masses of this guy because we're just going to be working with the uh, velocities. And we just solve. Solve these equations simultaneously. If you know how to do that, you solve this guy in terms of the rest of the stuff and plug it into our first equation. We'll go over that in class whenever you get to problems like that. And just some simple examples of head-on collisions. Uh, in this case, energy and momentum are both conserved, so we know it's perfectly elastic. So I'm going to show you a collision between two objects of the same mass while one mass is at rest. So remember, both these guys have the same mass, and one mass is not moving. So there's the one guy, and he's going to get smacked by this guy and fly off. And you see the first ball completely stopped. That's because all of its momentum was transferred to the other guy. It's because they have the same mass. All right, now this time the one at rest has twice the mass. So what do you think is going to happen now? We have a big white ball here. What's going to happen when the red ball smacks him? If you said the red ball is going to bounce backwards, you'd be correct, and the white ball goes flying. Now I'm going to show you a collision between two objects when the one that's moving has twice the mass. So this time the little guy is sitting still, and the big guy is going to hit it. Which way do you think the big guy is going to be going after they smack into each other? He's going to still go in the same way, and the red ball is going to go flying off. Because not all of his momentum was transferred completely to the red guy. 
All right, now I'm going to show you inelastic collisions. Only the momentum is conserved. It means they stick together. So what was this guy? The have the same mass, one mass at rest. So if one is at rest, the other one has the same mass and smacks into it, this is what happens. They're both going to go off. And since they have the same mass, they're going to have double the mass uh, after they stick together. So that velocity that they're going to be going with after they hit each other is like going to be half of the original velocity. Now I'm going to show you one at rest has twice the mass. So the red ball is still going to hit it and they're going to be moving off, but it's going to be a lot slower than half. Because now the mass is increased beyond two times. Now here's the one that's fatter moving and smacking the little guy that's at rest. He's going to have a pretty big velocity still after they smack into each other. All right, now we're going to move on to two-dimensional collisions. Now, these get a little trickier because there's angles involved, but you guys can handle it because you're all brilliant with your trigonometry. So for a general collision of two objects in two-dimensional space, the conservation of momentum principle implies that the total momentum of the system in each direction is conserved. So that means the momentum initial in the x equals momentum final in the x and momentum initial in the y equals momentum final in the y. And here it is written out with all your m's and v's plugged in. So here's the initial momentum all in the x direction. So we got three little subscripts in here. That's the velocity of the first one initially in the x direction. Velocity of the second one initially in the x direction. Velocity of the first one, its final velocity in the y direction, and so on and so on. So your subscripts can get a little cumbersome, but they're going to help you out when you know which direction you're talking about. So momentum is conserved in all directions. So we got to start using our subscripts. So I should just circle these in here. So subscripts are important. Get comfortable using subscripts. Don't just put v1 initial, but v1 initial in the x direction. They're useful for identifying which object we're talking about. We know all of v1s go with m1s. All of v2s go with m2s. Uh, and they also indicate initial or final values. That's why we have the i's and the f's. It's important to have those guys. And it also indicates the components of the velocity. So after these guys hit, might have a velocity in the x direction and a velocity in the y direction. I'm going to ask you for the total velocity. It's going to be the hypotenuse of that guy. So we're still using vectors, still using trig. I know you're excited. So if the collision is elastic, we can use conservation of energy as a second equation. I remember there can be a simpler one. Uh, a simpler equation can only be used for one-dimensional situations. So you can't use this guy in one dimension. Sorry. All right, so when we're talking about uh, two-dimensional collisions, it's usually because something glances off each other. This guy is hit directly this way, but he's not, the second ball is not right in its path, so it kind of just hits it on the side, like right there, and one guy gets bounced off that way, and this guy bounces off that way. So that's how we end up with our x component and our y components for each of these guys. So the after velocities have x's and y's, x, y. And we find those using our good old angles. Here's theta in here. Here's phi in here. So when we're using you know, the stuff down here, we want to use the, the phi or phi angle and up here, the theta angle. So momentum is conserved in the x and y directions, which we uh, already know. The initial momentum in the x equals the initial final momentum in the x. And we have to do two sets of equations, one in the x direction and one in the y direction separately. All right, so now I'm going to show you, just like I did with uh, one dimensional, I'm going to show you some two dimensional stuff. So I'm going to show you energy and momentum both being conserved. So that means perfectly uh, elastic collision. So this time they're both the same mass and one's at rest. He's at rest. I'm going to smack this guy in. They're going to fly off in different angles. Now notice your tip to tail method of addition of vectors comes important in here. So this yellow guy is 
the total initial momentum. The red guys are the momentum of the first ball and the momentum of the second ball. Now you see if we vector add the total momentum after, so we have to find the addition of this vector and this vector, and we use the tip to tail, so we slide that guy's tail down to the other guy's tip, the resultant vector is going to be like this, which, voila, is the same exact thing as the momentum before. So the addition of the vector component of the vectors for the final momentums of the two balls is going to still equal the initial momentum. Pretty neat. If you're a physicist, if you're an 11th grader, you probably don't care. All right. So here's an example. Particle one is moving at velocity v i one, and particle two is at rest. In the x direction, the initial momentum is just m1 v1 initial. In the y direction, there's nothing going on. No y components of any velocities here. So the initial momentum in the y direction is zero. After the collision, though, the momentum in the x direction is the blue ball's x momentum and the y ball's x momentum. We find those, we find v1s by, uh, sorry, we find it. The first mass is by mass times the final velocity, whatever this final velocity is, times the cosine of that angle. We find the second ball's uh, x momentum by using this angle in here, same way, cosine, because this creates a right triangle in here, even though that's not very straight. Two right triangles. We're talking about the x direction, the x direction, so we got to use cosine. And do the same thing for the y, except for using sine, because now we're talking about opposites. So then you just plug in everything you know. We know the, the first guy initially zero in the x direction, and afterwards it's going to be all this. And we know both of them, neither one have a initial velocity or initial momentum in the y direction, so there's zero zero, and we end up down with this. Now be careful. This guy is going to be negative because you can see it's y is pointing down. This guy's positive, y pointing up. So if the collision is elastic, we can then use our uh, kinetic energy stuff. This kinetic energy is conserved. And these will also be components too. Sorry. Lots of stuff at angles. All right, so here's an example of a problem that you're going to be doing several of in your book. Uh, some physics books, and this is how I learned it. Instead of writing like in the x direction, you have an i with a caret over top, and y direction is j with a caret over top. But anytime you see an i, like in my PowerPoints, it's just an x, and j's are uh, y's. So a car with a mass of 1,500 kilograms, this guy right here, traveling east at 25 meters per second, collides on an intersection with a 2,500 kilogram van going north at 20 meters per second. So we're going to try to find, uh, you know, the momentum after and all the velocities after and the angles and yada, yada, yada. And we're going to assume that it's perfectly inelastic, which means they stick together. Well, these guys are now stuck together. And we're just going to neglect friction because that's what we always do in CP physics. So we write down everything we know. We know the mass of the car is 1,500. We know the initial velocity, uh, the mass of the van is uh, 2,500 kilograms. Mass of the car is 1,500. Velocity of the car initially in the x direction is 25 meters per second. The initial velocity of the van in the y direction is 20 meters per second. We're going to try to find this VF, this red arrow right here, and we're going to try to find theta as well. So that's just all of our stuff written over again, and what we need to find, a little inventory that we made. So then we set up our equations. So the net momentum in the x direction equals the car's initial momentum plus the van's initial momentum, in which we know that this is zero because the van is traveling north, so it's all y direction, so no x. So we know the net momentum in the x direction before the collision is just going to be the car's momentum, which we find by multiplying this and this, and we get 3.75 times 10 to the 4. Uh, final momentum 
do the same thing. They're both going to have, since they stick together, we are we can add their masses because it's perfectly uh, inelastic. And now we know that it goes off at this some angle here. So in the x direction, the x component of that velocity is just going to be down here. So that's why we use the cosine. So we can plug in what we know now. Since we know the momentum in the x direction before equals the momentum uh, in the x direction after, we just set these two guys equal to each other. This is our addition of the masses. So you can see we get 3.75 times 10 to the 4 equals 4 times 10 to the 3 VF cosine theta. So we don't know what VF and cosine theta are yet, so we just leave it like that. And this is what I mean by solving equations simultaneously. You're going to get two equations of two unknowns. And if you knew linear algebra, it would be really easy. But I'm just going to show you a longer way to do it. We do the same thing in the y direction. There's no momentum for the car in the y direction, so we're just left with the momentum of the van to start with. And this is what you get. And finally, they stick together again. So we can add their masses. Uh, final velocity, but this time we're talking about the sine of it, because we want the y component. So you said this guy and this guy equal to each other. This guy equals this guy. That's what you get. So now you see we have two equations, two unknowns. How do we solve that? Sure, remember this from math class. So there's our two equations with our two unknowns. So basically what we do, we just solve each of these equations for this guy right here. So we do that by dividing both of these guys by what's left over. So Vf cosine theta. We divide this by Vf sine theta. And then we set these two guys equal to each other. So we get 3.75 times 10 to the 4 divided by Vf cosine theta equals 5 times 10 to the 4 over Vf sine theta. So when you're doing this, we can see that Let's try to get all the VFs and sine and thetas on one side and all the numbers on another side. So to do that, we divide both sides by 3.75 and we multiply both sides by VF sine theta. So you end up with VF sine theta over VF cosine theta equals our 5 times 10 to the 4 divided by 3.75 times 10 to the 4. Now you notice our VFs cancel out, which is just a sine over cosine, which is tangent. So now we just have one equation with one unknown, which we can solve for by doing inverse tangents. So inverse tangent of 1.33 will give us some angle, and that's the angle that gives us 5.3 or 53.1. Now that we have this guy, we can plug it into either one of these equations for our thetas, and now we only have one unknown in this guy. It makes it really easy to solve for. So we ended up plugging it into uh, this guy right here, solving for VF, and you get a VF of 15.6 meters per second. So that is it. Good luck with the problems. As always, any questions, ask me.